Welcome to another edition of Dungeons and Social Distancing with Nerdarchy. Today we dive into Mythic Odysseys of Theros with the races. Welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I'm Nerdix Dave, and as usual, I'm joined by this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. If you want to see us talk about new books as they are released, make sure you click that subscribe button. And to keep that new content flowing, make sure you attune to that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Before we jump back into the world of Theros, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, D&D Beyond. It's a great resource and digital tool for all things 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. It makes shooting these videos and getting our information and doing our research so much easier, as well as building encounters, creating characters, and doing all kinds of things over there. You can play your games using D&D Beyond. You know, there's even a dice roller you know, feature within it uh, that's, you know, that the ever-expanding library of dice is, is growing. And the Mythic Odysseys of Theros dice are super sweet because they can do things that regular dice just can't do. you got to check it out. Link's going to be down below. Now, uh, right now, you can pre-order these books on Amazon or you can get them digitally from D&D Beyond. I know we've got D&D Beyond up on our devices so that we can dive into this material and check out these uh, cool new races. When we look at Mythic Odysseys of Theros, basically they're telling us there are six races that you're commonly found there, and really any of the other races from the PHB uh, are not generally available. They're going to have to come from someplace else. You know, a diverse assortment of peoples dwell among the islands of Theros. Aside from humans, the races in the PHB are unknown to Theros unless they're visiting from other worlds. So, while you can technically be allowed to, to do that, you know, you are, you know, having to say, all right, well, you're going to encounter people who have no idea what you are. And to have elves and dwarves not known... Uh, that that is pretty crazy because they are you know considered common races in just about every other campaign setting. Right. So I dig that. Right, and then that begs to ask the question: Would they be subject to getting supernatural gifts if they're from someplace else? Uh, because, well, <laughs> because right, a lot of them seem very tied to the world and the gods. I, I think it would have to be for the campaign if you wanted things to be balanced. Uh, it's not like the races here are more powerful, you know, than anything else. Uh, so perhaps it is that supernatural gift that has transported you from one world to the next. And while being here, you get that. But, you know, we can, you know, if you want to hear us talk about the supernatural gifts, you can check out the, uh, the last video that went up. So there are six races, Human, Centaur, Le Leonin, Minotaur, Satyr, and Triton that can all be found in this book. Now, Triton was actually first appeared in Volo's Guide to Monsters. We actually did a video for it. The card will be up here somewhere so you can go see what we have to say about it. The only real difference is the Tritons in this, in this world, Theros, have dark vision. They can see in the depths of the sea. And I kind of remember, remember us complaining and bitching about why do they live at the bottom of the ocean but they can't see. They, they can't see. How, what are they doing? It's not like you can light a torch down there. Centaur and Minotaur came out in Guild, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and you know there aren't any changes related to those races. So we're just getting a reprint, and you know they're they're clearly a regular race here on Theros. Yep. Again, you can find the card. Check them out. But so now we get into kind of like the exciting part for us because we love to pillage these settings, these campaign settings for you know the new races and you know the new things that we can add to our game uh, i i am a or I, I was a magic the gathering player and i am familiar with the the leonin race uh, there's a number of magic cards that I, I still have even though i you know gave off or sold off most of my collection uh but you know being born in august i'm a leo uh i've always found lions and and you know great cats uh, inspiring, they're awesome, you know. So the Leonin race was something that really spoke to me. So to, to get stats for them that vast, vastly differ from that Tabaxi race, and I was like, all right, you know, you could definitely add these to your uh, to your world without too much of a problem, especially if you're already playing with Tabaxi. Yeah, they definitely feel like the kind of the bro dude version of the Tabaxis. Uh, they seem a lot more physical um, and, and you know burly in nature. 
right? And they have titles like noble and fierce, quick to quarrel, pride and self-reliance. And like the, I really enjoyed reading the quick to quarrel, quarrel uh, aspect of them because it was just kind of like they just like to, they just like to brawl and fight, whether it's verbally or physically. Yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, they have a you know distant relation, if at all, with the gods. So they even have their own uh, quirk table of what is their attitude or relationship with the gods, including I don't talk about it amongst my other Leonin, but I actually revere the gods and try to please them by by my actions. So like, you've got you've got an out if you want to play a uh, a, a religious Leonin. Uh, but, you know, diving into their traits, your con goes up by two and your strength by one. Uh, the, their size is, you know, over, typically over six feet tall with some standing over seven, but you are medium. There is a whole, you know, schematic breakdown, you know, right within their, their size of, you know, determining height and weight. Their base walking speed is 35. They have dark vision out to 60 feet. Their claws are natural weapons used to make unarmed strikes, which are a D4 slashing damage, plus your strength mod, instead of bludgeoning damage normally for unarmed strike. You have Hunter's Instincts. You are proficient in any one of the following skills. Athletics, Intimidation, Perception, or Survival. You also have Daunting Roar that you can use as a bonus action. Creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you that can hear you must succeed on a Wisdom save or become frightened of you until the end of your turn. The DC is equal to 8, plus your proficiency, plus constitution modifier, and it can be used once per rest, short or long. And then you get languages that you can speak, read, and write common and Leonin. Yeah, I really love the daunting roar and the fact they made it a bonus action. A lot of times when you get these powers, and I'm looking at you, Dragonborn, and it does a thing, and it just doesn't scowl well. You know, it becomes like, you know, you could use your action to do this racial trait that you have or you can do about anything else and it'll probably be better I, I i completely agree you know we've said this probably in you know dozens of videos but you know that's why in our world dragonborn breath weapon is a, is a bonus action uh you know to have that listed okay i got this cool thing that i can do now i still have my action to cast a spell or make it make an attack or do any number of other great things now clearly our, our leonins are going to be really good at being martial classes uh, you know, any of them is going to work well with that con strength split. Uh, but they're also a bit more mobile on the battlefield, so that's also going to be helpful to particular classes. Like, anybody can benefit from that. But, you know, you get a little extra oomph, I feel like, when you look at, like, the Barbarian or the Monk or even, you know, the skirmish, the skirmisher scout-type rogue character. You know, I like the fact that the, the con is their, is their plus two. Uh, you know, it gives you a little bit more freedom to, to play, uh, and as you said, you know, the, the con is going to be good for everybody, so totally, uh, totally digging what they did here. So next up we have the Seder, and I feel like we're going to see a lot of Seders in, in our games now. And they've got <laughs> headers like Born, Born of the Wild, Embracing Life, Art of the Revel, Very Odd Indeed. Yeah, the, say, the satyrs have some uh, fantastic abilities. Uh, they have a chart. Uh, instead of you know quirks, they've got eccentricities. Uh, so there isn't a tree or statue that isn't fun to climb. Sometimes talking to a plant really helps. Uh, I imagine that my clothes are my glorious soul on display for all the world to behold, and I dress accordingly. So like th these kind of things are such are such full of whim and and uh, you know whatnot that you know I. I totally dig it. It fits the ideal that we all have for what, what satyrs are and what they would be. Uh, and that's before we even get into you know, the actual uh, traits. Now, when we do get into the traits, they're going to get a plus two to charisma and plus one to dex, which is always a great split. Uh, again, we're going to have our physical traits like our weight and our height and that kind of thing. Uh, they age at the, about the same rate as humans. Their speed is also 35 feet, so we got a lot of fleet-footed fleet uh, folk in this world. Their type is fey rather than humanoid. Ram, you can use your head and horns to make unarmed strikes. If you hit with them, you deal bludgeoning dam damage equal to a d4 plus uh, your strength modifier. They have magic resistance. They just have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Mirthful Leap. 
Whenever you make a long or high jump, you can roll a D8 and add that number rolled to the number of feet you cover. Even when making a standing jump, the extra distance costs movement as normal, so they're really good at jumping. Reveler, you have proficiency in perform and persuasion skills and have proficiency with one musical instrument of your choice. Languages you can speak, read, and write common and sylvan. Uh, oh my, Th these are really strong. I mean, spell resistance is really good. Uh, it's going to be useful. Uh, they have you know a great s stat split if you're talking about playing a rogue, a paladin, a warlock, a sorcerer, any of those charisma casters. Uh, it's going to be really good for it. You know, but you know, dex and charisma, you know, are are generally you know good stats for anyone that's going to use any interaction skills, and then to automatically have performance and persuasion. Uh, you know, two two skills that are lining up with that plus two. Uh, that's that's super helpful. So looking at the Seder with with their wide array of abilities, you know, using different different stats, different things, you know, the movement speed, the the head ram, you know, the the jump and and the spell resistance. Like these are all things that I think are going to come up throughout the course of of a, of a campaign. Uh, so I think you know it's going to be good for no matter what class you play. I, I think it's you know, it's probably the the most powerful race in Theros. Uh, do you have a favorite race for Theros? Uh, I, I mean, I I kind of already you know spilled the beans on that one, but you know despite you know Satyr's uh, <laughs> overly Hold powerful on, abilities, uh, thematically I would love to play uh, Elianen. I think they are they are they are awesome, and I haven't done you know much in the in the way of a, a martial character for any long-standing game like one. It's you know fully fully there, uh, so I think that you know that could be a, a fun one. And you know me like typically I'm all about the gods. So to to have one that's like yeah, you know forget this god nonsense. I'm I'm gonna do what I want. I think that could be a lot of fun to play against my normal type. Yeah, that, I mean that would be a lot of fun, you know. I, I the Leonin is very is is a fun and interesting type. I love Minotaurs, I love Centaurs. Like it would be really easy for me to pick one of the races that are only really in this world and play that without my, which problems. And then like adding Anvil Rot to anything is seems like a lot of fun where basically you're turning your character into a robotic or a construct form of whatever race you're mm -hmm. playing. Or even a big toy, you know, like the toy soldier type. So there's definitely some cool things, that you can, cool areas you can delve into there. Uh, so did you miss our earlier Mythic Odysseys of Theros conversation? You can check it out in the card right above. Do you like adding new D&D content to your games? Well, every month we create content for 5e for both players and GMs alike over on Patreon. But that's not all. We do weekly hangouts with our patrons monthly giveaways that our patients are automatically entered in, and more. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.